think for a minute what is to be one month without electricity and then maybe three months how your lives will change maybe six at that point where are you? Right? maybe nine <laughs> you didn't have water either so and maybe a whole year so when you go to a place when there's maybe you went the third month or the ninth month without electricity or water uh, things change it's not the same approach and you have to listen actually and find the people that have the energy to move the community just look for them. Uh, we have lots of problems. Uh, we we start a community kitchen in the mountain. We start feeding 350 people every day for three months. We were just asking the community, um, please, you know, bring whatever you have. If you have, if you can donate any food at all, um, uh, come. If you can donate money, or you can just uh, give us our, your volunteer work. That was just a community, right? Because when a hurricane or anything, uh, any emergency like that came, what you have is the people around you. You don't have anything else. Government didn't came after almost a year. You know? So we, we knew we were kind of, we were alone. And, uh, but we, in the mountain, we, we knew that we have, you know, the river and we have, we know where the food was, you know, we have the roots and everything. And, uh, and we started doing the community kitchen and then people start getting, you know, coming to the neighborhood and a lot of people, just a lot of volunteers, uh, a lot of male white volunteers that, that they just want to have adventure. And um, for us it was very difficult. Then they start coming to universities or and organizations, and there's a very different. Uh, and it depends a lot of who is leading that team of students. It's really dependent on the sensibility of that person, how much he knows about this stuff. Like Corey, when Corey went with Texas A&M, um, the students were great. They just asked what it was, what we needed, because we don't. People don't have time to think. They're just like, I, we were organizing while our house was broken completely. We didn't have any place to stay. In my cousin, we were staying in my cousin's house. Where we have to, you know, redo the house while you have old people that are, just, that are you know, I'm 39, <laughs> but there's people that are 80, they didn't have anything to eat. And so you get priorities, right? And, um, so we have to deal a lot with people just like didn't understanding the language, didn't want to hear anything. Um, they just they just were coming to rescue and to rescue us. They know how to rescue without any <laughs> considerations at all, and that puts us in a place of really we get really tired of just leaving, you know. With all of those relationships, <laughs> and uh, and uh, for us was was very difficult. And um, unless people like from there were uh, this community from Chicago that came, they they study I think three weeks Puerto Rican history. <laughs> uh, they they study the political situation of Puerto Rico, get a map. You know, people that weren't from Puerto Rico, and they actually came and did a great job um, in trying to understand what was happening. And there's another thing, the University of Puerto Rico, uh, uh, where basically the organization that is in Mariana, in our neighborhood, the organization has been like 35 years. And the last four years have a program with the University of Puerto Rico of social workers students or social workers. Uh, when I came and when I saw what they were doing, they were, just, they were going around uh, 
doing census, right, of the people in Mariana. And what, what I find out when I check it, it was a very extractive relationship. Because the organization didn't have anything, actually. Just, we got data for doing proposals, but we didn't actually, there were no serving people. We didn't know where the people was that, that need help. And uh, it was just for data purpose. So that's another consideration when we talk about the relationship of academy, the relationship with community. And, and uh, we can talk a lot about all this, but um, closing my, my, my part now, is the idea of community. And, I, and I'm going to stick with this, like, what is community? University is a community. But the word is two words actually. It's common unity, right? It's not just ge geographical. You can expand and broaden your thinking about, about how can you help not only that geographical community, but if, if, if you're with the, you know, if you're doing biology, what is the biology community doing in Puerto Rico? And maybe you can actually help. Not, you don't have even to go <laughs> to the place. You can just meet the people that are doing the work that your community is doing, like law or biology. Who is the people that are doing that in Puerto Rico? How can I help to help them? Because they know already in the community, they know already the language. We can just back them up. And it's actually easier. I understand the, the, that there's a relation, there's, there's a need of the experience of the students, right? And that's very valuable. But how you do that, how you do that, it can change things when you're done. Thank you so much. Please. I think it's also what Kim has mentioned of what they learn, you know, basically supporting the existing clinics that are in Puerto Rico, that's, uh, that's part of building the community, you know, all the, uh, the people that, that, are, uh, that are working on the same thing, how we can uh, build it. I, I wanted to do a little bit. Did music help you through this process? <laughs> because uh, not only, I'm a composer, so I, I see things through a, a blank slate. And I work with rhythm, and I work with harmony, and I work with melody, and, and I, I drive all the process of organizing the community with other people like my wife and, and other uh, leaders of the community as a piece. You know, there's rhythms for everything and there's moments, you know, harmony is about um, understanding what creates tensions. And you can't have a perfect fifth that is almost like you, right? Like not that, like a no, but you can have a Augmented fourth that really is really tense and you can actually feel it and when you're working with people There's people that doesn't want to talk to each other and That's an augmented fourth, but if you kind of put a seventh third person that complete the chord Maybe they can get together better, right and just easy get easier the so we I my my part was just like looking at the rhythms and looking at the melodies uh, and uh, of of my neighborhood and my you know so we can express better organization. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the lovely uh, we have uh, Mr. Wilson Santiago. Uh, she is from the University of Texas at El Paso, and she's a clinical professor, and she will sharing. Uh, her experience with an uh, emergency disaster relief after true service. Mm -hmm. there. Uh, good morning, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation to be here. I'm a civil engineer by training, but I'm a peace engineer. It's an emerging field of engineering where we want to solve and connect uh, problems from communities to engineering solutions. But making sure that we incorporate the community and social issues. So we work in different, difficult places. I'm a co-founder of the Global Society for Peace Engineering, and that's what we're trying to, to foster. Uh, 
the work in Puerto Rico, I mean, we, um, I've worked in several places, um, in Haiti, Dominican Republic, um, in Brazil, and the work in Puerto Rico started as a volunteer effort. So we started doing fundraising to get filters, filters that we've used in Ecuador and Philippines that are very effective. We thought, well, why not use them in Puerto Rico? So I started doing a fundraising, a GoFundMe, and I thought, well, we'll get $3,000, but we started getting over $9,000. I got the filters at cost, and then got 647 filters, and I'm like, what do I do now with those filters? Uh, the Dell Corporation offered to send them uh, for free, but I'm from Puerto Rico, so I knew that I don't think that's such a good idea. So what I did, <laughs> so what I did was I connected with Boy Scout troops in Puerto Rico, and they were the ones that worked. And so. Two of the uh, two Boy Scouts got, got their eagle badges, and I'm so proud of one of them because he has Asperger's, and he did an amazing job. He would text me, "I'm your representative," because I would tell them, "You have people's lives in your hands. You're representing me." So it was really a wonderful experience. So um, they delivered the filters and showed the people how to use them. Then the second project was um, La Hamaca. It's a suspension bridge in Utuado. It's an iconic, or at the time was an iconic bridge. If you Google La Maca, people take pictures, wedding pictures. There's an economy around the bridge, about the, you know, from the people that live around there. So the the bridge was destroyed. So you see here the bridge after, uh, I mean before and after. So that's that was a big project, and so we said, well, we need to partner with other organizations. So I guess without limits at New Mexico State University and Engineers for a Sustainable World at UTEP. We got together and the students designed a, a new suspension bridge. Um, and uh, we called the project Rise Up. We didn't, I mean, this was before we knew about Rise, but the students call it Rise Up and the teachers. <laughs> anyway, so this is the bridge. Uh, so we spent a total of 51 students participated. We did rotations. Uh, between the two organizations, and in one month, uh, we built the bridge. Here are some of the pictures of the students and some of the work. This was hands-on experience. It was multidisciplinary. Um, we had a lot of support from the community. Um, I was a lot on the local radio station, talking to people. We visited the, the homes, talked to the people, and uh, really, you know, the community is super important because we had limited budget for food, and in the end, we didn't even have to use the budget for food because everybody was feeding us. So we would be working, and one day someone called, oh, we're getting lunch for the kids, and so we got there. I introduced the kids to the concept of limbers. Everybody knows what limbers are? I love limbers. <laughs> anyway. So, well, I'm going to need a limber here. <laughs> well, no, 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 but uh, what was interesting is that they were interviewing a student, and they're like, well, what do you want us to get you? And he said limbers, and then the next day there were 60 limbers there waiting for the students, for all of them, uh, popsicles, in case. Yeah. Yeah. Frozen, something so, else. So why is this important? We're connecting educational understanding of the students to hands-on experiences. Uh, that's one of the key issues. Uh, students find meaning and purpose for their profession. They connect uh, their impact as engineers on human lives. You see the tears in the eyes of this woman. We were talking to them. We went through the neighbors. You know, we, we took time off to go to the community in the middle of the job. And they, were, they had tears in their eyes thinking, you know, these students that we don't know are coming here to give us love. That's how they called it. They didn't say they came to build a bridge. They came to give us love. And so that was very important. Um, this is Mr. Gonzalez here. And I did a, it's not a best translation, but he said, I thank God for you because you have left your homes and your families, your states where you come from, and you have allowed you to come and give us your time to help rise up. That is unforgettable, something we can never forget. How people who still do not know us can love us and come here to spend time with us. So that was amazing. Interpersonal skills. The students learned to uh, work in a multidisciplinary environment with different levels of education, talking to people from, you know, from the mayor to the neighbor that lives close to the place. Um, we had help from the marine merchants from Albany. 
they came to help us for three days. And it was a gruesome task, because at the beginning we had to move a lot of rocks. So like for a week, that's all we did. Um, academic knowledge and skills, the students designed and had to build and use engineering information to do that. Um, I'm a big um, supporter of women in STEM, so I made sure that all of the female students in the group did as much as the male and had the opportunity to do so. And uh, we're teaching students by doing, and that is really, really important. Um, the third project we have is, uh, it was inspired by the University of Puerto Rico at Mayagüez. The Institute for Electrical Engineers had given some funding to the University of Puerto Rico Mayagüez to build this charging oasis, and I think that there's about three in the island. Yeah. Um, but they were complaining that it's a structure that you have to put there and it's in wood, so if there's a hurricane, they have to dismantle and not everybody knows how to put it back together. So we came up uh, with the idea of a portable charging oasis. So um, this is the beta version, it's all in aluminum, and this will go to the University of Puerto Rico in Macau. So maybe we can write a song about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, so we're doing the fundraising because the shipping is expensive, but it's basically a plug-in operation. You, it's doors with solar panels. You, people can plug their computers, USB ports. It's going to have a hotspot for Wi-Fi. And uh, in the new versions that we're developing, we'll have also water filters. So uh, these are some of the students. We partner with the uh, a welder, a local welder. He's, his name is Rick Hot Rods. That's his nickname. In a way, he builds fuel tanks for hot rods. So we didn't want to do it in aluminum because we were like, Rick, this is really expensive. And he's like, no, we have to do it in aluminum. So he gave us some of the materials. And we used his shop. And he, I think he was too overconfident. He, get, he let the students do more than I would have. But <laughs> the students did everything, yeah. Um, and then this is in Utuado, the students we camped in. Uh, Basketball court, and I just wanted to read this poem to you. One of the neighbors from Tuago told us that, and it's a great poem. Um, so this was uh, in homenaje to all of the engineers, ingenieros, and ingenieras. Que vivan los ingenieros y las ingenieras. Ya la hamaca tiene sombra, tiene color, tiene brillo, tiene caballos y río y un pueblo que la nombra. Y en esa Biblia de alfombra de los jóvenes viajeros tan sencillos, tan obreros, que de sus lujos prescinden, qué bueno que no se rinden, que vivan los ingenieros. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, uh, thank you. We welcome your questions and donations. <laughs> interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary group, and each of their experiences different in terms of uh, where they were, what they did, but in the end, what ties them together is community. You know, that's, that's what RISE is, and that's what we want to talk more about. So um, before I make questions for the panel, I want the community to, if they if anyone has a comment or question for any of our panelists or to each one of them, just feel free. So just a, a general question. Um, first, thank you all. We've got a lot of it. Um, I'm from a very small campus, uh, a couple hours north of here, so up in the northern Adirondacks. And um, we're very rural, very isolated. And so when you talk about community, uh, does that community exist before the disaster, before the event, or is that made as a result of the event? Because you know, we try to reach, we're trying to reach out and um, be a part of that community, but it, uh, I guess what am I trying to say? It's, it's hard if there's nothing like for us to focus on. Like we need to go and do this. So what would be? How do you get into a community? And just reaching out? Is it just networking? Or? Okay. Um, so I, I just, we just came from a house from a volunteer that came to our community. Mm -hmm. He's an uh, American uh, that helped us. He just, he just got to the University of Puerto Rico 
He stand, he was white, um, with the white hair. Everybody knew he wasn't from there. <laughs> and he was like, how can I help? And in the university, and then a friend of mine that was in the university works there in Macau. Mm -hmm. Like he said, well, you know, here there's not much, but there's a community in Mariana that really are uh, doing a lot of stuff. So I can take you there. So he went first time. He came with them with their family. He came three times. He made like a, a fundraising for the community. You know, he involved, he said, look, I want to do a, a dinner for all the community. I want to be like my, he was a Jew, he, he's Jewish, so the church kind of, he put uh, the church uh, help to, in Christmas, they, they actually, they didn't eat meat and they buy a pig uh, for the community because culturally, that's what we eat at the end. I just, he picked me up in the airport. I stayed with the family. He was holding my daughter my new daughter, she's six months. Um, he he drive all the way from almost New York City to here to take us and then come back. And I think, again, it's, it's just sometimes, it's it's listening, just 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 going there and, and, and say, what can I do for you? If you have the means to do it. If you don't, well, it's very difficult to help, right? But, but if you have the means, so the legwork is just sort of suiting up and showing up. Yeah. And, and at the same time, uh, there's one, that's one thing, but there's other one that you can connect with the universities and that uh, are around, or communities that you know that are doing stuff and go before yeah. things. I think the, uni the university shouldn't go, I think they should connect yes. with the communities mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. something yeah. happens, then yeah. you have established. Mm -hmm. And there's so many things that students can do for a community. Yeah. You know, in, in places, they should, universities should be, should be around the whole town. Right. Doing business, helping business people to just get, get better, architecture, everything. That should be like a city of the university, that, you know, but it's not like that. Sometimes it's just isolated. Yeah. Yeah, we have to change right. that, I think. Yeah, and, and I think that one of the things that I've learned over the years, I've been teaching clinical legal education, which is where second and third year students do free legal work um, since, last century. I started teaching in 1999. Uh, so, uh, it was a long time. It feels like something. But the thing that I found, when I first started teaching, I had these great ideas as to what I wanted to do. And so I like designed things and went out and offered them to people. And I got some good things going. Now I learned that I just go places. So, when, so after the first, I mean, when we were getting ready to do our first trip, we did a little outreach. And then when we came back, we showed up at the at holiday events. We showed up at the Hispanic Day Parade. We're like there to hear what people need from us and to talk about what we saw, but to then to re I mean, your point, really listen. And also listen, and especially as, as lawyers and policy people, I love your musical stuff. I don't know music as well as you do, but the whole not, not quite in harmony, but you can add a chord to change the, the harmonics. That's something that, that you can do. It's you don't necessarily need to take people into a place where there's discord. You can add something, change something, and have policies created that can make change during the future. But I think the other thing is, is you know, in service learning, going to the places that move people's hearts that you'll find real people is my suggestion. And then backing into designing an academic program that will be able to respond to that, which is now how I design everything that I do instead of coming with my brilliant ideas of what the world needs. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to add that to the point of the community, um, let me just give you an example. Uh, in Haiti, I work with the community, and when I go there, I see this concrete mixer in the corner, rusting. And I'm like, what is that doing there? Well, someone came with a great idea because the community, they don't have homes. They just have like homes made out of whatever. Like, someone had a great idea. They need concrete homes. They need, so someone donated a concrete mixer and cinder blocks and everything. And not one time was that used. I mean, it was there in the corner of rusting because they didn't think that's what they needed. Mm -hmm. So it's not like we come from the outside thinking they need homes because of hurricanes. So for the community, the main need was the water. And that's what brought them together. Uh, and so the students, it was another service learning activity. The students and I designed um, 
a water treatment system using solar power for 500 people. Now, th that's not the, the, the biggest success. The biggest success is that that civil infrastructure has become a social infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where the community have come together. So like a month after it was installed, three solar panels were stolen at gunpoint from someone outside the community. And the community said, uh-uh-uh, this is not gonna happen again. So now everybody gathers, they themselves take care of the system. It's the only place where on the north side there's the shade. So the moms sit there while the kids play. At night it's the only place with light, with electricity, so it's like the gathering place. So that I mean, for me, the success of the social infrastructure is even greater because it has united the community. And what they had in common was the common need. You know, you're talking how you can start. On the other hand, in Otuado, you know, we tried to install some solar panels in the community. There was so much, so many problems amongst the community members. You know, you go to one house and they tell you, oh, don't talk to that person. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's really hard. So that was not the right place to say, oh, let's start a project with the community because... There's no common unity. There's no, <laughs> there's no common unity. So, you know, there's that, that, that balance between, okay, let's find a common need and get the community together. In the colonies in Mexico where I've worked, it's the same thing, the common need is water. So that's what unites mm -hmm. the community. So, Thank you so much for everything that you all have said so far. Um, I'm an assistant professor of communication at Utah Valley University, and I teach a crisis communication class. And I'm really motivated to uh, turn it into a, a more service learning oriented course. And you all have offered a, a lot of things for me to think about in that, that transition, in that development process. I was hoping to maybe uh, bring you a little bit more advice. Who, what would you say to someone who is interested in, in developing a course like this? What are the things to start with? <laughs> we, we actually are a, doing an organization that is called Emerge Puerto Rico after the project. And we are uh, interviewing and understanding what we did and what, what, well, what went well and what did not <laughs> to create a curriculum um, on the experience on the Puerto Rico and Maria. So um, one of, I think um, Christine, my wife, is gonna, is gonna talk about communication, actually. Um, um, she, was, she was there. And uh, I think in terms of communication, that was the most important thing after hearing it. Like, we received so much help because Christine started, we were, we were in the mountain, sometimes uh, we have to drive because we didn't have any phone for three months, so we have to drive to San Juan to some place, um, counting the gasoline, um, uh, to just, and we just go over there to just communicate. And having a community, family outside Puerto Rico was the thing that was most important. Because you, we delegate communication uh, we just communicate a video, and usually it was Christine to talk about things, what we're doing, what we need, you know, everything, like really, like a script, you know, um, and, uh, and, and then send it and tell my sister that she was in Chicago, blow it up, you know, like you need to just like communicate to everybody because we can't. Mm -hmm. So having that community outside, it's so important. It's, it's, and, and, and it makes me again rethink what community, right? Sometimes you just want to go over there and all these people are there. Sometimes your place is where, exactly where you are in the US, in Spain, everywhere. And we got so much help about communication. For us, communication was the difference. When she started communicating, a plane of a private person just sent a plane to put communication in the Loma to give us Wi-Fi. Just came a private plane. That doesn't happen, it's just crazy. We didn't even knew the person. Christine was in a chat like, well, she would talk about that in that. But, she imagine, that, that's just crazy. We were living just like crazy time manifestation. Like, we were so naked <coughs> that we were just like thinking things and things were happening. And that's the, I think, not having anything to lose. 
takes you in a place of just like really starting to manifest and understand your power. Mm -hmm. it, that makes you, you know, a year without six, um, a year without electricity, it just changed you completely. And we were seeing things just happening right before our eyes, like we think, well, we need, we need solar panels, and then friend of a friend of a friend of a person <laughs> talked to somebody, and some German people just came to La Loma to offer us solar panels. Oh, we need this, and we, so we start actually manifesting in our minds. I, I, I know that sounds so weird, but it's just like crazy. We got so many stuff for the community that we are just creating a curriculum. And we, we have two spaces. We rescue a school, a bad school. I studied when I was young, when I was little, when I was in kindergarten. Um, it was a bad because they closed that school. And now it's a community center, solar power, with batteries and everything. They got, you know, everything that you can imagine, like furniture. We find a library. Um, and, and that's the, I think that's the power of communication. And that's the power of relationship and building com common unities into what you love. And that's another part of it. Just help where you love. You know, help where you really feel like. Don't, don't do something that, that is just going to limit you. Just like, if you're in political science, just go there and try to find your community that fits, you know, and do something beautiful. And I'm happy to talk with you offline yes. like, about specific design issues. I think that one of the things that was most, that, that continues to be most distressing to me is, is bringing the people who have absolutely no background, just, but really want to help mm -hmm. and know Spanish and making sure that, that they're in a space that they can provide what I term helpful help. That's my big thing, is, des is designing things in that way, um, so that we do create the knowledge that's going to give them a life of service, and give them depth of understanding, um, and new, co new levels of cultural confidence. But it's hard. I would say start small, too. You know, it's like if you're starting to develop a curriculum, try and see which courses would best fit, uh, you know, community service, starting with that, and, and seeing how the students find a place in, in a space that they can feel comfortable and that they feel that they can use their skills to, for the benefit of the community. So that's that's how I started, just like, you know, doing an engineering. I'm an engineer, so um, my dean calls me an engineer activist. I use engineering <laughs> as, as an activist. So like, you know, some guy had a problem in his yard flooding, you know, because he says the city built this levee. So, that's how I started. So okay, let's go. It's free consulting, but the students learn. So so things things of that nature and start small. Volunteer or incorporate into a course. Yes. Thank you for sharing those wonderful experiences. And uh, my name